hit the record yeah. button. But uh, it's time for change, and it's one of those things where, you know, this other company, um, they offered, you know, I've been talking to them for a little over a year, and they, they finally made, made me an offer. It was an exciting opportunity and kind of hard to turn down a 30% raise. So Awesome. Yeah. What's your field? Uh, um, computers. Yeah. Cool. Techno technological industry. It's uh, uh, it'll be a little bit different role for me, but it'll it'll be fun. It's exciting. Okay. So, um, I will do an intro for you. Okay. So we and basically what I did is I got your profile off your um, site. Okay. And um, other than that, man, I just wanted to chat with you. So, perfect. <coughs> I also want to talk about this at some point in time. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> well, we can go ahead and start talking about that. So one of the things that I try to force, not really force, but teach upon my kids are, is, um, or I want to teach my kids is how to better themselves when it comes to finances, right? In the public school and even the private school systems, horribly fail at teaching us how to be successful with our money. Right. I, I mean, it's a breeding ground for corporate, um, corporate ants. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Right. I saw, and I saw a, a funny meme last night. Of course we're here, you know, right after two days after tax, um, the tax deadline in the, in the, and the meme was, I'm so glad I learned about parallelograms because this parallelogram season, it has, you know, worked well for me, you know? And, and then it went on to say, why didn't y'all teach us how to do our taxes? Um, and and kind of get in how to, you know, manage our money better so we didn't have to pay as much, all this stuff. And I, I think it's an excellent point. So, you know, you've released this book. It's just recently released, right? The Boy Who Lost His Wallet. Yep, that was just released uh, earlier this year. Okay, and no, no coincidence that the little boy's name's Danny, right? In the story. Exactly. None at all. No. Um, I've got the book series coming out. So this, the boy who lost his wallet is the first book in the wealth lessons for kids series. And okay. right now the plan is to do five and each book is focused on a lesson that I've learned through my life. And so the stories are based on real life experience and important things that I picked up along the way that have kind of led me or shaped me into who I am today. And when I talk to investors that work with us or friends and family who ask me like, Danny, how do you have this real estate entrepreneur business and what do you do? Um, the common response that I always get is I wish I would have learned these things earlier. Yeah. And so, you know, similar to you, Jay, and wanting to teach your kids to be better and understand finance where there's a major gap in education around money and just how to handle it from a day-to-day -day perspective. I really wanted to introduce these, you know, little children's books where parents can educate maybe themselves, but also the next generation to be comfortable with money. The other piece to it is you know, money is a taboo conversation that most households in America and in the world don't have and really need to have. And so that's the major driving force around getting this book out there and really kind of breaking down that barrier where parents are comfortable to talk about money with kids. Because, you know, even when I was growing up, I learned these things kind of on my own. My parents didn't sit me down and say, Danny, this is how you balance a checkbook or this is how much money we make and this is how much money we spend. It was very taboo and kind of like this black box of, you know, we just kind of live our lives and move on. Um, and, and I think that's just, I, I think there's a better opportunity to share and educate um, with young people and certainly the education system uh, could improve in that regard. I'm going to, you know, do whatever I can to make that better and have the next generation or even, you know, all people in the world educated and comfortable about money. Yeah. 
All right. So you mentioned a couple of things there. Thank you for making that adjustment, by the way. You mentioned something there. Money is a taboo at most, uh, taboo topic in most homes. I think if I phrased it exactly how you did, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I agree. I mean, it, with, you know, one of the things that growing up, it's not that my parents meant to do this, but it was just our situation. You know, their, their comments were, Hey, we, we can't afford that. Right. They were just shooting me straight. Hey, we can't afford it. And I, I love, I think it's Kiyosaki who says, or maybe, yeah, I think it's Kiyosaki who says, uh, you know, it's not how you, it's the question should be, how can we afford that? Right. So is that part of the series is coming out? Is that going to be part of your book, book series as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the main lesson and the takeaway from the first book is really about protecting your money. And then as the series continues, we're going to talk about tracking your money. So kind of the basic um, income and expense grid and how that works. Yep. And then we're going to talk about ways to make money. So another thing that I did growing up is I was always hustling in the neighborhood. I had a lawn mowing business. I would um, paint people's houses. I would, I grew up in Michigan on a lake. And so in the summer, in the springtime, people always wanted new sand down on their beach. And so I would shovel sand and it was probably the hardest job that I've ever yeah. had because I was a little, you know, probably 70 pound kid <laughs> trying to move a wheelbarrow full of probably 150 pounds of sand down this wet grass and sloshing around. And it was, um, it really shaped me into who I am and really knowing like how hard people work for a dollar and how important that is. And, you know, it's one reason why I take such great care as friends and family and new investors invest in our real estate deals because I know what it takes to work for a dollar and how hard people, um, you know, invest their time and their effort to earn that income and how, how well we need to protect that and make sure that it's always there for yeah. them. Yeah. And you know, it's funny because the, the, the um, conversation I just had, as a guy that I'm mentoring, and he has approached his, his grandmother about getting a loan from her, right. And, and doing some flips or something, you know, invest that money for her. And he posted in the Facebook group that I have, uh, and there was a lot of backlash against him. Said, no, you shouldn't take your grandmother's money, you know, and, and because I've talked to him and I told him this because I've talked to him for several uh, weeks now, I feel like I know him a little better and know where his heart's at and understand it a little bit better. But I told him, I said, look, if I would have just saw that message without knowing you and talking to you before, I would have responded very similar to, <laughs> to those folks. But what do you say to somebody who, you know, you has a grandmother or grand, just grandparent uh, who has some cash sitting around, she wants to put it into, you know, a CD, uh, which I think, you know, for our generation, CDs are, a joke, but it's, you, you know, maybe they're not, I don't know. We can talk about that if you want, but you know, you get that very minimum return. Your, your money's pretty much locked in for a, a time period. And you, you know, he's like, look, grandma, let's put it in a money market account. You're going to get similar returns. And then when we find an opportunity, let me, you know, exponentially grow that for you. Would you throw, I mean, would you use your grandmother or grandparents money to invest? I would. You would. And th the reason for that is um, I've, I've done it myself with my own money. And so I've kind of got that background and experience to be able to yeah. say, look, um, I know that I can invest, you know, this chunk of income or capital and have it return in this way with a predictable outcome from that. And so, um, you know, that's just how I've kind of built my investor base and credibility and reputation is really kind of putting your money where your mouth is. And so um, everything that I've done has always been with my own money. And in every single deal that we put together today with our apartment syndication group, PassiveInvesting.com, we always invest alongside the investors as well. And so if it's 
an inexperienced person and they're doing their first deal, I would say maybe don't take grandma's money, yeah. um, but maybe, you know, invest your own money or maybe bring in a friend or someone who is not in that kind of retirement age yeah. where their capital could, um, could elongate if the, the deal changes or something comes up because your grandma in the retirement phase needs the, the capital more importantly than an extra few percent return. Yeah. And that's, that's, um, very similar advice that I gave him. So it's good to, good to know that you and I agree on that. <laughs> so by the way, I just saw you drink some coffee. How do you, or drink something? Is it coffee? I'm assuming. How coffee. You, yep. How do you take a coffee? I just do a little bit of cream. And that's it. That's it. So have you always been that way? Yeah. Okay. So I hate the taste of actual coffee. Okay. But I, having kids and getting up at, you know, before five, I've got to have some. So I've been, I loaded up with sugar and creamer to the point where I've, I've realized this is not the healthiest choice for me. So I am trying to, you know, like getting up early, that was an exercise for me. I would set my alarm clock 15 minutes earlier, you know, get up for two weeks straight like that, then back it up again and keep doing that. I'm doing the same thing with coffee uh, to try to get to just straight black, but it's not going as well. <laughs> Because I'll get to that point where I'll get one scoop of sugar and one one scoop of creamer, and I'm like, man, this just tastes horrible. I can't do it. Anyway, I'll do sidebars like that. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe maybe try to change up your coffee too. That's not a bad idea. Okay, like the actual brand that you're using. What do you drink? What do you drink for your? You know, my uh, my wife moved me away from the Keurig cups, and I would really? usually get. Um, Starbucks or like the grocery store brand or okay. donut shop. And she was saying like, Hey, this stuff probably isn't the best for you and move me to bulletproof coffee okay. um, comes from whole foods. And so it's, you know, all natural organically sourced um, with the, I don't want to use the right farming term, but ethically, <laughs> yeah. um, ethically sourced coffee beans as okay. well. And so um, the Bulletproof coffee is very smooth. And as I've been educated from friends <laughs> having a coffee obsession, yeah. um, there's certainly a different taste that comes with the bean type and how okay. they roast it through the process. I'm going to look them up. Bulletproof coffee. Okay. Maybe that's it. Maybe I'm drinking the wrong brand. Try it. But, but no more Keurig for you. No, I do a French press. I don't even know what that is. So that's where I'm at in my coffee drinking. I don't even know what that is really. This, the French press is like $15 and it gets me like three cups. Okay. So I just make it, let it brew for 10 minutes, press it down. And then I've got my kind of coffee for the morning. Sounds easy enough. I'll have to look into that too. You're educating me all kind of on all kind of different stuff this morning. So, <laughs> Hey, so tell me, uh, do you have kids now? No kids yet. No kids. Okay. So, uh, you know, I, was, I, I didn't think I was uh, trying to do some research on you and I didn't see any pictures of kids or anything. I did see some pictures of like a safari that you guys were just on. So yep. I want to get into that. But I was, I was sitting there thinking, okay, well, if he doesn't have kids, how, you know, because what I like to do is I like to get advice from people who have been there and done that. Right. So I think, you know, if, if, um, let's just say Warren Buffett's parents wrote a book on how to build wealth. That would one I would definitely buy. Obviously I bought yours, right? And there's my son's four years old. My, my daughter's two. Um, and I'm, my wife always reads them as she's putting them in the bed, but I've started with my son, um, to read about certain topics. And I've been looking for books on financing, building wealth, and there's just a, not a lot of them out there. You know, and, and I thought, well, when I saw yours become available, I was like, I got to order it, you know? And so, but I want, I was going to say, what uh, experience do you have that gives you the right to write uh, a children's book? And I'm sitting here thinking, I was like, he's been a kid himself, right? He's, he's, he's writing about his own experiences. So um, I, I appreciate you sharing me, sharing that with me that this is about you, 
right? Did you actually lose your wallet when you were, when you were younger? Five years uh, old. Five years old. The story, set, story goes. And so this is a biography. It is. Pretty much. Okay. All right. Well, I'm interested to see what comes out next uh, in the series of five. That's awesome. Um, but let's switch gears for a minute. So you talked about uh, working with family and friends, which a lot of people don't are uncomfortable with, right? And, and they've subscribed to the whole Dave Ramsey comment. I think it's who, who made it about um, if a deal goes bad or either way how the deal goes, the Thanksgiving dinner conversation is going to change. Um, obviously, you don't subscribe to that, but you also participate in every deal you do, right? So you're in the same boat. What, what are some of the things that you've done to help people understand on your family and friend side that, Hey, you know, this is a good, good deal for you to participate in. So what are some of the, I want to say tricks, but what are some of the things that you've used that you understand convinces family and friends to participate, right? Because a lot of people are skeptical of real estate for, you know, for good reasons, right? They're, they've had a bad They've had a bad taste in their mouth. They got just caught up in the 2008 crisis. A lot of different things. But you've obviously had some success at convincing your family and friends to participate. What's, what's, your, what's your trick, man? What's, what's the deal? You know, what I'm going to say is early on raising money is extremely difficult. Um, when you don't have right. track record and experience, you will be challenged many, many times where you'll come up with a list of people that you want to talk to and reach out to. And most of them are going to say no. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that they don't like you or they don't believe in you, but they, you're probably not doing the best job of explaining it or presenting the opportunity. And so it's really your fault. And so yeah. once I kind of realized that, um, I, I really just started one person at a time and it's not about selling them. It's not about, you know, tricking them into investing. It's just about talking about what we do on a day to day basis. And if the opportunity is a good fit for you, then that's great. I welcome you in, but yeah. there's no, you know, high pressure sales tactics or anything like that. And I think just sharing your content, having some sort of thought leadership platform, whether it be a podcast or, you know, typing up white papers and posting them on your blog about real estate and how you've done this deal. I think transparency is the most important thing that you can have to, number one, talk and share about what's going on. If you don't do that, you're never going to get investors. And then number two, it's really about building that credibility. And so being able to sit down with someone and say, here's a deal, here's the numbers on this one. This is how it worked out. You know, if that's something you're interested in, let me know. I'll be happy to talk to you when the next opportunity comes up. Yeah. And of course, if it's not a good fit for you at this time, totally understand. You let me know if you're ever interested down the road. Yeah. And a lot of people, you know, especially on their first deal, and I, and I appreciate and love that you made that comment that early on, it's, it, it's going to be more difficult because as you get your, really even your first deal under your belt, then people are going to start, more people are going to start paying attention to you, right? Especially even banks and lending institutions, because they're going to ask you, you know, what's your experience? And they're going to be like, as soon as you spat off that first deal you, you're a part of, they're like, oh, okay, well, then this guy's got some credibility. But, and I totally forgot where I was going with that. Oh, I know what it was. <laughs> Sorry, Dan. No worries. <laughs> so some folks that I've talked to here recently, they struggle with even starting the conversation. Why do you think that is, other than just fear of being turned down, you know? I think you hit it on the head with fear or being uncomfortable. Um, yeah. You know, most people, and I, it goes back to kind of the Tony Robbins mentality of people do things either for pleasure or to avoid pain. And a lot of the times people, the pain of something is going to influence your decision more so than 
the positive that could come from it. And so the pain of being turned down or the pain of feeling um, strange inside of you is going to hold people back from having that conversation. And it's not about me coming to you and saying, Jay, hey, I need $50,000. I've got an investment opportunity. You're going to love it. You know, do you have 50000 to invest? That's not how you do it at all. It's just saying, hey, Jay, you know, um, it's good to, good to catch up with you again. I know it's been a while. Uh, over the last 12 months, you know, I've been working on these real estate deals. And what my company and I do is we purchase 150 unit apartment communities that we can add value to. And the way we add value is by increasing the amenities on the property. We renovate the interior and the exterior of the unit. And what it allows us to do is increase the rent that we're charging. And with real estate and how apartment communities are valued, when you can increase the income that the property generates, it becomes worth more money. And so we've been able to have really good success over the last couple of years doing these value add projects where, you know, we and our investors are able to generate a good return on our money. So, you know, I'm glad we're catching up now. And if that's something you're interested, let me know. But, you know, Jay, I want to hear about your kids. I know they're four and they're two now. So how have they been from one and three and you yeah. know, how's your wife doing? Yeah, I, I, that's awesome. I like it. And I think you said something earlier and I didn't touch on it. So I'll, I'll do that now is, is you've got to, understand what they want out of a potential investment, right? And it's not, hey, here's this deal, you got to invest, blah, blah, blah. It's sitting down and understanding, hey, are they going to be a good fit? You know, here's a potential deal that we're working. Uh, here's the projected returns. It is an investment. There is some risk to it. Do you understand all that? You know, and making sure, and, 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 and as you say it, uh, feel the pain of being to told no, there's a lot of folks who struggle with asking people for money that just haven't felt the pain because they're afraid to, right? They're afraid that they have that, have that conversation. So, um, so you guys have been obviously, go ahead. You're about to say something. I, yeah. I was going to say one way to do this is just to practice. If, if yeah. you're uncomfortable talking to people, you know, go to Starbucks, get a coffee and, you know, bump into the person when they're filling up their coffee with cream and sugar and just say, Oh, excuse me. I didn't mean to bump you. How are you doing this morning? Mm. Yeah. What do you like to do for fun? Let's just ask them three questions and you're going to have a conversation. You're going to feel uncomfortable because it's probably new, but yeah. the point being is in that conversation, get to the point where you ask them, you know, either what they do for fun or what they do, you know, are you here for a meeting this morning? What kind of line of business are you in? Then they're going to ask you the return question. And right. now is your time to say, I'm a real estate entrepreneur. We buy 150 unit plus apartment communities with a value add strategy. Yeah. And leave it at that. And you got to have that elevator, elevator pitch down too, right? So, I, which I love that you just. Practice with some strangers, fail miserably, yes. you know. Get comfortable Sorry. with that pain because, right, because the, the, uh, what's the saying? I had a, I had a college professor. Uh, he was a retired Marine. I think he's retired. He was, he was in his fifties, but, um, his, his mantra was pain is your friend because it lets you know you're still alive. Okay. And this is coming from a professor teaching a computer science 400 level course. <laughs> most people didn't pass. So he, and he had an interesting way of teaching, uh, you know, he was, but I will say I learned the most out of that class because you had, you had to come prepared, but Oh yeah. Yeah. He was, he's one of those guys. He came and so real quick, he came in, um, first day of class, he hands out the syllabus, tells us, Hey, for our next class, which we met on Tuesdays and Thursdays for Thursday's class, we're going to review chapters one and two. I'll see y'all. That was it. So we come in, Thursday morning, he says, anybody have questions on chapters one and two? Nobody raised their hand. Okay. And now this is a class where we have a midterm and a final. So there's only two tests. 
and he says, okay, chapters one, nobody has any questions. That means y'all know everything there is to know about it. Chapters one and two are closed for discussion for the semester. Chapters three and four are reading assignments for Tuesday. I'll see y'all Tuesday at class. And that was it. And that's how he, he, the entire semester was like that. And I learned, and if you didn't ask the question, you had to be able to answer somebody else's question because you didn't have your hand raised. So you knew it all, right? I learned more out of that class than any other class I took in college. That's phenomenal. Yeah. And quite frankly, he's the only professor that I still talk about other than ones that were really mean. (laughs) (laughs) But anyway, um, so, so you've got the money raised, you know, you're raising money. Y'all have been very successful. So let's talk about passive investing, kind of what y'all are doing now. So what's, what's been your focus uh, for the last couple of years? And then I want to get your take on where you think the market's headed. Yeah. So our group, we've been buying 150 unit plus apartment communities. We partner with our investor network on putting deals together and most recently, we're very excited. We, um, we purchased the PassiveInvesting.com domain name um, for an undisclosed sum of money. And we were able to kind of rebrand our syndication uh, group and business under that umbrella name, PassiveInvesting.com. And what that's allowed us to do is really have better conversations with folks about what we're doing because for the apartment value add opportunities that we put together, we always include our passive investors, our friends and family and, and close, um, close network. And so what we do there, again, it's the value add strategy from a very, very high level. Our plan to go in is to increase the income, control slash optimize our expenses and really increase the net operating income year over year with that property because the difference between multifamily investing and single family home investing is as a multifamily investor, I can really control and influence the value of that asset because it's, it's valued based on the income that it generates. Just like a business, you know, if Apple sells a billion more iPhones or iPads, they're going to be worth more in the future from those sales than they are today. And the same thing goes for an apartment community. So if you're charging a thousand dollars of rent and you could increase that rent to, you know, $1,100 a month, that's a 10% increase. And so it really adds up and it's um, a really powerful way to create equity and value for real estate. And you know, the other side to real estate, as well and you know why everyone is listening to your podcast is because they are interested in real estate and we know that real estate has a lot of pros that other investment opportunities don't have like you know our apartment investments allow for monthly cash flow distributions and that's real money into your pocket on a monthly basis as opposed to a stock investment which you know doesn't really give you money and you probably reinvest the dividend if there is one and it's, you know, very low return there. So, you know, cash flow, um, you have some tax advantages as well by investing passively in real estate. And so, you know, the other thing is capital preservation. If you look at the Forbes 500 list of the wealthiest people in the world, you know, 90% of them either, use real estate to protect their wealth and keep it at a very high level, or they've used real estate to build their wealth and amass the fortune to get them on that list. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's amazing. More people don't do it now. And it's also one of those things I'm amazed it took me so long to get involved. (laughs) You know? Um, So you said that y'all focus on 150 unit plus, uh, apartment complexes. Why the minimum of 150 units? What's the what's the science behind that? The economies of scale are just a little bit greater as you increase in size, and it is you know 150 units. You know, give or take some, depending on the right opportunity. But that 150 unit mark really allows you for 
operating efficiencies. And so the largest expense that you're going to have for an apartment community is your on-site staff. So the payroll of the maintenance staff and the leasing office. And so with 150 units, you can kind of optimize or hone in on having two full-time people or two and a half or, you know, three people. And that works really well. But even if you have a hundred or like a 50 unit apartment community, you still probably need to have at least two full-time people. And so the income that's generated, that payroll expense is going to be a large portion of that or a larger portion compared to if you had 150 units. And so that's yeah. kind of how it works around that. So that's the best, um, uh, best rule of thumb for y'all to do a napkin, start doing a napkin test to see. If it works. You know, that's what works for us, but there's definitely other ways that people can be successful with smaller size units and having economies of scale there. But that's yeah. just what works for our group and how we track it. I hear your buddy in the background barking. So what, what you got there? What's his name or her George. name? George. He's a mini George. golden doodle. <laughs> I'm not even going to touch that. Me, uh, George, the mini golden doodle. All right. <laughs> so um, you mentioned uh, slashing operating expenses uh, when you take on one of these properties new. So what are some of the, the low hanging fruit that you typically see in a new acquisition and how long does it take you to get those expenses turned around to where they're either lowered or just uh, totally uh, wiped out altogether? Yeah, a couple quick ones would be marketing and your kind of technology systems. And so our group, we've got um, people on our team who are very experienced with marketing and technology. And so we've come in and really utilized our personal experience to reduce those expenses when we can use things like Google AdWords to turn marketing spend on or turn it off um, as opposed to historical property operators that just spend a fixed amount every month. And, you know, if you're 97% occupied, you probably don't need to be as aggressive as when you were 90 and trying to get there. And so that's one way we do it. Also technology um, changing from a traditional phone cable and internet package from your Comcast or direct provider is right. another way that we can get around it using some like VOIP phone services. Huge way to reduce your spend and have a better experience for residents calling in because you can set up a digital phone tree and, and really have a better experience than you know, being placed on hold and waiting or having yeah. multiple phone lines that you pay for. So those are really low hanging fruit. And then the other one I mentioned was around the staffing of the property. So we'll really do a, a, a good job of evaluating what the staffing needs are for that type of asset, the age, the amount of um, incoming repairs that occur on a, a weekly basis. Do we have too many maintenance people or do we need more maintenance people? And then um, the other thing with our group is we really focus on just a couple of markets. And so if we have um, multiple properties in the same neighborhood within a five mile radius or so, we can definitely hmm. reduce expenses for the the group as a whole by having better um, economies of scale there. Yeah. You can also drive the market price a little bit too when you do that, no, can't you? <laughs> You know, there, the, the long-term plan, maybe you own everything in the city. I don't know, everything in the state, country. Yeah. Know, but, uh, and that's when, that's when the government becomes, gets attention and then, you, you know, rent control gets put in place and you're like, man, I was way too aggressive. So what you said, you, you guys focus on specifically a few markets. What markets are those and why do you, why do you focus on those? We focus on the Southeast U.S., Okay. Um, specifically, we're, we're pretty bullish in kind of our backyard, Greenville, South Carolina. Um, we really like that market. And we look at a couple of the smaller um, metros. So we, we don't really look at Atlanta too much because there's a lot of competition. There's a lot of big... Plus it's Atlanta. There's a lot of big... <laughs> there's a lot of big... 
uh, corporate competition in there yeah. as well from REITs and stuff. And so they can, they've got some economies of scale when they've got um, tens of thousands of assets. And so they can kind of drive pricing and things like that. So we, we look at some of these smaller markets, but again, high level indicators that we look at are job growth and population growth. So if the job community is growing and there's more industry going on and jobs are being created as well as population growth, we've got a good recipe for a consistent rental market and likely an increase in rent demand, thus creating a natural increase in pricing um, for, for the apartments that folks are looking at. And so for us, the Southeast U.S. has that. There's a lot of people who are moving just naturally from the north to the south for kind of that weather and the lifestyle. So it's, it's an affordable place, the Southeast U.S., when you compare it to living in like a New York or a California or something like that. So yeah. people can have a, a great lifestyle, an affordable lifestyle, and be outside year-round. And so it's a, it's a good recipe as well as, you know, pro pro business um, in the yeah. growth that is occurring too. So, you know, just in South Carolina where my partners and I live, we've got a ton of influx in manufacturing jobs, yeah. aerospace with Boeing and Charleston. We've got um, the shipping port. So transportation is going to be a huge thing as we continue to grow. And so, you know, the one thing you were saying is you wanted to get to my market outlook um, while no one has the crystal ball to say our real estate prices going up or down, I think we're in a pretty good place right now where, and when I say pretty good place in the markets that I know, Southeast US, um, because we're still seeing job growth and we're still seeing population growth. And so I don't think things are going to take a drastic turn. Um, I think we've got just a, a pretty good runway of growth or natural um, natural maintaining of market levels. And so by us doing value add opportunities, even what we can do if the rent prices stay the same, we can just up the level of the product that we're offering and again, naturally increase the demand and the price that we can get. Um, which is the reason why we always invest in value add opportunities is yeah. because we know, you know, even if the rent demand for apartments stays the same, if we've got a better product and we can demand a higher price, then, you know, our business plan is going to be achieved. Yeah. Yeah. And, and two, um, the way I look at it is if you're investing in those value add, which I, I'm assuming is like a B class or a C class, uh, property and the rents affect that, right? So you're not at the top end, you're not at the bottom, you're right in the middle. And if a downturn does hit the economy, which is going to affect the market, then you may experience some turnover from tenants, which means you're just going to get a different level of tenant, right? Usually from the upper bracket, it's going to come down. Um, so that's, that's why I, I love that asset class. That's kind of where we're at. We've got one property that's probably a C minus D that, uh, I'm trying to get rid of, uh, cash flows really nicely, but, um, my tenant stays in prison for six months out of the year. So what do you do? You know, <laughs> uh, it, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it, it was a very early purchase for us and, uh, we don't want it anymore. So we're trying to get rid of it you know you know I think that's really good to hear because I don't hear it frequently enough where people are kind of reevaluating what's in their portfolio and you know just like you Jay when my wife and I got started many years ago we we were just buying deals because they were profitable and so yeah we're kind of going through that same stage right now where we're trying to liquidate and clean out what's in our portfolio and really shifting all of that capital into multifamily value add opportunities because we know that business so well and it's performed so well and 
you know, again, economies of scale and operation, if, if you don't have to manage and oversee and have the headaches of that D property, you're going to be a happier person. Yeah. Your wife is going to be happier and your kids are going to be happier because you're alleviated from the stress of that asset. And so yes. I think it's awesome to hear that you guys are ready to move on yeah. from that. And my property manager will be happier too. <laughs> most definitely yeah and it's it's one of those things where they're really helping us out here and we're just like look man just we're, we're gonna get we're gonna we're gonna get rid of it um just bear with us we'll, we'll do it when you know um so anyway that's happening but um so i want to talk about um your involvement with the first t i noticed that in your profile um so talk to me a little bit i've got a good buddy of mine i, I say he's a good buddy he's becoming a great friend he's uh he actually, we found him as the DJ of our wedding, but he, he does a lot with uh, the first T, the Northwest Florida chapter, uh, which with Bubba Watson being close to, you know, close to living in Pensacola or growing up in Pensacola has a lot of connections there. So uh, Marty, Marty, I'm going to butcher your last name, but I just want to give you a shout out to Stanovich. Thank you. Man, that's horrible. Yeah, he's awesome. a great friend. I can't pronounce his last name. <laughs> uh, which is a uh that is something that i struggle with even you know i, I interviewed a great couple uh la oh, saturday uh and their last name is ashkenazi if i'm saying that right and i asked you when we first started hey how do you pronounce your last name even though i've heard it 15 different times i needed that <laughs> quick reminder but let's talk about the first t your involvement there and 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 give them a plug real quick because i know it's a it's a great organization to be a part yeah, of Yeah, you know, I've got such great passion for helping young people again with the book and that, but, um, you know, a passion of mine was golf and growing up golf really taught me a lot of lessons and it really shaped kind of who I am today in being able to participate in a sport where you immediately see results either, either pass or fail you either hit the shot or you fail. And it all comes down to the one person who's responsible. And so it teaches you a lot about life, about responsibility, about ownership, about being a good steward of the game, taking care of the grounds as you walk around and you know, being nice to the other players and participants. Um, so it teaches you about being humble, being respectful, and using the game of golf and working with the young people, the first tee has got a phenomenal program to just help young people not only play the game of golf, but also learn the game of life. And so I love being able to go and help the kids with their golf game, but also just talk about what's going on in their day. Um, you know, we, we help kids that range from about five to high school age and it's a wide variety. I can relate to all of them. I've been there. I've got that experience. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so I can help kind of just give them little lessons of, you know, if, if you're being bullied, you know, let's talk about how we can get around it. Or if maybe you're a very quiet individual and you don't have a lot of self-esteem, let's get that self-esteem on the golf course and let's have you believe in yourself and be a better person and help your friends and, you know, be a humble, good steward of life and, you know, kind of get you on the right track. Yeah. Uh, and I, I was introduced to that organization through um, Marty and, and while I don't play golf, I've got some lower back issues that prevent me from doing that. <laughs> um, and I'm glad because that's my excuse for being horrible at another sport. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, I, th I think the organization, the more I learn about it is, is amazing, you know? So, uh, I'm, I was glad to see that's part of your profile and you, you and you advertise that. So that's awesome. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's switch gears for a minute. You guys recently, and I say you guys, you, you and your wife went on a safari recently. Yeah. We, we just got back from South Africa a couple of days ago. Okay. Um, I, I want to say those, I'm hoping, I don't think this was the case cause I think one of the pictures, uh, it was of your wife and these lions were in the background and they were uh, too close for my comfort. <laughs> so, t so tell me about that. I mean, was, I mean, it looks like you guys were just in this Jeep, just cruising through the safari and, and then, Hey, here's a group of lions. Apparently they don't like you getting this close to, to their food or 
I don't know, but it made me uncomfortable just looking at the pitchers. So tell me about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, so in South Africa, again, the, um, the community and the people there that protect the wildlife are so passionate about what they do and the care for the animals is first and foremost. Um, but the, the animals have developed the relationships with the game drivers who drive the Jeeps and take people around. And so they're comfortable with a group of people being, you know, in, in the Jeep, in the vehicle and being able to get a little bit close to them. And so we were probably, you know, five or 10 feet away. And it, it's just an amazing experience to go into their home, into their kingdom and see the animals in their natural state. It's a, just a whole nother feeling as opposed to going to a zoo. And yeah. while we were there, my wife was like, I don't think I'm ever going to go to a zoo again. <laughs> yeah. you, you get such a cool appreciation for following an animal while they're moving or walking around or seeing a, um, a group of elephants that are going to the watering hole to, to drink and to bathe. And it, it's just a really cool way to have an appreciation for animals that we can't see on a regular basis. And just knowing that there's a lot of different components that make up the, the universe and yeah. you know, how we live on a daily basis. I definitely, I, I agree with, I think this has definitely been eye opening experience. I don't know that I want to get as close as you guys did though. That, that, and for, for example, so there is a, um, there's a place near where my parents live. It's called Tigers for Tomorrow, where they take in these big cats that people thought they wanted as pets mm. and, and then they outgrew them. So now it's kind of like a zoo for, for that. But, um, we were there visiting and one of the, I don't know if you call them trainers or, you know, one of the folks that worked there had walked up, apparently has a relationship with this tiger and, but she turned her back. Now the tiger's in the cage, right? And he's on the opposite end of the, the cage from where she's at. And it's a, it's a little bit bigger cage than, than you see at the zoo. But the trainer turned her back to the tiger and within a matter of seconds, cause that tiger was kind of crouching up like he was going to play with her. Well, then she turned her back and this tiger sprinted and within about, I say two seconds, he was up on top of the fence. Like he's right, ready to get her. And I have never seen, you know, usually when you go to the zoo, you see a tiger either laying around or just barely moving. Uh, this, this cat was quick. And I know we're talking about lions and tigers. It doesn't matter. They're either way they're, they're gonna, if they, 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 they both scare me the same amount. So, um, but that's, that's awesome. I, I, I think that's on our, um, our bucket list. I just don't know that I want to get as close to y'all without some sort of cage. Cause I mean, y'all are just in an open Jeep. Yeah. The way, the way it looked like it was just open yeah. Jeep. Yeah. yeah. If I really wanted to reach out and really stretch, I could probably touch a wild lion right there you know and i'm like That's yeah but you don't want to do that again yeah. kind of, you know, yeah. being in the vehicle and you know being yeah. uh, of course respectful to the habitat that they live in you're in their home and uh if you want to stick your hand out you may be uh snacked upon yes Let's don't do that. Then let's not. Yeah. <laughs> Although I would be tempted. And that's why, you know, your wife sounds like with the coffee, she's like the voice of reason. My <laughs> wife is very much the voice of reason when it comes to uh, me keeping all of my appendages. Right. Yeah. And, and uh, that she would definitely have to accompany me on that trip. Well, look, Danny, I've enjoyed talking to you. I know you've got a lot going on and we're coming up on time, but I want to give you a chance to plug passive investing and tell people more about, uh, what you're doing there and how they can get in touch with you. Yeah. If, if people are interested in passively investing with us in our value add apartment opportunities, just go to passiveinvesting.com. If you are interested to keep in touch with me or follow up and look at the boy who lost his wallet, the first book in the wealth lessons for kids book series, it's available on Amazon. You can also go to randazzocapital.com and click the link to, to jump you to the Amazon page to buy the book. 
Perfect. I will make links to those in the show notes. Any idea of when, cause I, I understand as I talk to people who have um, published books that that is a bit of a process, uh, especially when you got something as professionally illustrated as yours. It, do you have any idea of when the, the next couple are going to come out or are you going to release all at once or what does that look like? Or do you know yet? The next book should be out within a couple of months okay. and we'll kind of do like a, a six month rotation or maybe every four months until we get to that fifth book and then we'll evaluate the series and, and see where we go from there. Nice. I'm looking forward to having it in our library as well so I can start reading it to my son. So, um, which we skipped last night's reading cause we just finished up, um, Jocko Willings, uh, the warrior kid. Nice. Uh, so, so this is next on the, on the list. So, um, I gave him a break last night cause he was, he had had a really good day. Not that reading to him is punishment, but he had had a really good day and we wanted to reward him. Uh, so he got a little extra iPad time last night. Nice. So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, Danny, I, I would love to link back up with you when the next couple of books comes out. Cool. We'll talk about those, but I've enjoyed it, man. Um, I appreciate you joining me this early in the morning and uh, we'll talk again soon. Okay. Sounds great, Jay. Thank you so much for having me on. You bet.